So hello everyone and welcome to a new looking uh, All Things Latix podcast. We are using new technology guys. The uh, studio is locked. Um, Billy's lost his hair in the meantime. And, uh, <laughs> hope you're all doing okay. Hope you're all um, enjoying uh, the weather that's come with this painful lockdown. I uh, hope you're coping all right. Um, I shall introduce myself. I'm Simon. Uh, this guy that way is me. Yeah. Oh, well, you see, we're all in different positions on each other's screen, so I know. I just realized that when I did I'm that. Like, oh, no. <laughs> Where's he pointing here? Is <laughs> that right? I can't point over the desk this time. <laughs> and uh, we joined by the, our, our uh, third new third wheel. That must be me then, Billy, because you That's do this all the time, you. so that must be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello, we both. Are you both doing all right? Brilliant. How, how are you? Uh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, it's all right. You know, I mean, it's just, you've got to make the best of it, because what other alternatives have we got? The weather's been all right. We can go out for walks, and yeah, just got to get on with it, haven't you? You've got a, a, a familiar-looking shirt there. Who's Who's... This, this little beauty, is uh, Lee Croft's 2016-17 shirt, match worn and everything. And I'm delighted to say for me that in lockdown, uh, I, I've kind of been exercising, so it fits. So, you know, all, all good. I, I could play athletics in this season. Are you telling us that, that you actually fit into one of Lee Croft's shirts? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm all right with it. Yeah, it's, yeah, like guns and stuff now, yeah. <laughs> all good, all good. <laughs> I'm not sure what we can say about Crofty with that one then, but... <laughs> well, I, been, uh, not, I've lost a bit of weight, so I'm all right. I was right. going to say... Nick, yeah. So Crofty must be... Yeah, yeah, he's a pro then. Yeah, we're all good. Let, let's, let's be good with Crofty. He's, he's obviously... Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you've been, you've been very, working very hard there, Brody. Working very hard to get into Crofty's shirt. <laughs> Sounds a bit flirty, that. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Brent? How are you, Billy? I'm, be, I'm all good. Um, obviously, yeah, I've lost uh, a little bit of hair. Um, raised a couple of hundred quid for obviously once upon a smile, which is yeah, well done on that, mate. So yeah, obviously I was um, I was trying to grow it to see how long I could get it, um, but Leona wasn't having any of it and decided that <laughs> you'll get the clippers to it. So I said that's that's raised some money for a great cause. Um, other than that, um, I did spend some time on furlough, but now I'm, I'm back at work. I'm but we're gonna Anna, so they've brought us back in. Not a, a very limited staff, but we are back. Yep, so you're, uh, you're back on the, the pictures, aren't you? Yeah, we are. We're um, Obviously, we don't know, like everybody else, what's going on, but we're just maintaining it as, as best we can. And It's difficult with the, with only a certain number of staff, but we're getting on with it, and like the other country, we're just battling on. Great. What about you, Brookie? Oh, you know, opposite Billy Gromier. Um, basically, um, just, just the same as you, kind of all our staff went on to furlough. Uh, Quite early, actually. Obviously, it was the 20th of March when the uh, kind of announcements about hospitality particularly uh, came out. So um, I'll not lie, it's been difficult, but we've, uh, you know, we've, we've stuck together as teams still in touch with each other. I'm doing what I can with the business stuff and uh, I'll be honest, enjoying a bit of sun along the way. It's quite nice working from the garden and uh, uh, helps, helps, uh, helps lift the mood of things. I've been missing the podcast, though. That dark, dark yeah. studio we're normally in, it's... Uh, it's we have been texting, haven't we, and trying to come up with ideas and things. And now now Brookie's, now Brookie's done it, we're, we're actually doing it. <laughs> yeah, so, took, one, took one of us at some point to take, to take the bull by the arms with this one. Yeah. We have got um, quite a few bits coming up, though, haven't we? Uh, hopefully some... Uh, if this one works, we'll, uh, we'll get some um, players and some uh, staff and some former... Uh, some other probably... Uh, football people and local celebs and everybody on for a, for a couple of uh, sessions and recordings. Absolutely. We, we might have one today. Oh, really? Well, stay tuned, everyone. We may, we may have a special guest later. Um, That's reliant on two things. One, Billy sorting it, and two, between us being able to sort the technology out. Yeah, now... Yeah, <laughs> that's a very good point. It's like the analysis. Analysis <laughs> work. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, thanks for that, Brody. We'll see if we, 
<laughs> well, it's under promise over deliver, mate. That's that's where we've got to go. I was trying to build it up a little bit, but you're right. You just you just suckered us under both the two challenges that neither of us are receiving. So yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> so um, we uh, we just thought we'd uh, take some time on this bit. We're going to talk about the lockdown in football in general. Things are a bit quiet on the boundary part front, so. Um, I know we've all got broader you work in football a lot. You've got a lot of contacts around as well, commercially, and it'd be good to get your your thoughts on on where things are. Um, we're also going to look at a bit of um, some anniversary news. It's what would have been the end of the season, so uh, there's plenty of anniversaries that we've been uh, we've been enjoying over the past few weeks, um, especially on Twitter and social with with the likes of OFC memories and people posting posting us many, many memories on there and lots of other people show it, sharing their thoughts. So we'll come to that. Um, and then perhaps we'll, we'll just look at uh, what the, some of the latest announcements may need as well. And um, we'll, we'll wrap it up there probably, but we'll crack on first and foremost with um, with a little look at, at lockdown in football. It's been, a, it's been a challenging time, a very strange time for me. Um, no football around. Um, difficult to know how how the kind of general mood is around, I guess, in, in football clubs. Um, what's your, I mean, Brody, you're still uh, every day trying to, uh, trying to um, earn a bit of money here and there. So, um, what, you know, what, what's your, what, what have you found these last few weeks? What's the general mood? The general mood is that sports sponsorships fallen off a cliff. Is the uh, the general mood? I like the honesty. I like the honesty. Well, you've got man, you know, it's if you're a business, if you're a, a small or medium sized business, um, and you would ordinarily have some money set aside for sponsorship, are you now going to put that money in sponsorship? Are you going to keep it in your own cash flow when you don't know how long you might be at reduced capacity for? If you are not classed as essential, how long you you might still be closed for? Um, yeah, it's a difficult one. So I mean, for me personally, um. I speak to, I mean, I'm still, I'm still working as such. So in my role, I'm commercial manager for, uh, for Will and Shire matches at the moment, and I'm keeping, keeping that going and speaking to all their, their sponsors and what have you, trying to, get, trying to get some renewals done and things like that. It's not easy because probably 85% of the people you speak to are either furloughed or they're not working now. Um, clubs, I've been speaking to quite a lot of clubs. Um, there's a club in League Two. It isn't Oldham. I'll clarify that straight away. It isn't Oldham. There's a club in League Two that in January went out for their front of shirt sponsorship for next season. And they wanted £125,000 for that. I spoke to their commercial guy about 10 days ago. They would now snatch anyone's hand off for 70 So you're looking, that's like best part of, uh, you're knocking 50 grand off it. Um, all because they just can't get one. And you're at a crucial time for league clubs and certainly League One, League Two, National League, because when all your kits are getting manufactured and being brought in, you need your front of shirt sponsors. And a lot of the time, that along with season ticket money, their first payments will be the money that helps you get through the summer. So it's, yeah, it's a difficult time. I've been speaking to a fair few clubs that are, that are stuck a little bit because their commercial people are all on furlough. So they can't go out and get the work. Um, it's, it's a very difficult time, especially with the uncertainty of knowing when football will be back, what the implications are for finishing this season, and then what next season looks like. And does it start with fans? Does it start behind closed doors? If I was a business now, and if I was a club now that could still do it, I'd be absolutely trying to get the best website sponsor you can get because on that basis, if you're entitled to stream all your matches for if you finish this season, which is 50-50 at best, but if you've got your first 10 games next season that end up being behind closed doors and the league allow you to stream them, well, if you're a business now that's got a bit of money and got a bit of savvy about it, sponsor a club website because you'll get so much coverage from it. So it's, it's things like that and both clubs and businesses trying to be clever about it and hopefully building from there. So we've um, some great points in terms of that because we, we, we're hearing this week that League One and League Two, it looks like um, certainly the, 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 the direction of travel is certainly in, 
it has, has been for the last couple of weeks has been towards potentially ending this season as it stands. Um, it looks like there could be an announcement this week to that effect. Obviously, that would probably be dependent on the clubs actually um, voting on that, being the members clubs. So, um, do you think that will clarify the situation a little bit for, for from a commercial point of view for some clubs? Or, or are we still, you know, back to where we were, I'm, I'm, you know, the, you're just still waiting. He's no, no, no idea when next season starts though. That's it. That's the daft pit. And no one's ever been in this situation before. So there's no right or wrong answer. So the Premier League, for example, they want to do all they can to get the season finished. Whereas the National League voted to end their season, but then didn't vote how to end it. So, you know, you, you look at it and for me, the National League have gone too soon because if the football league out now, let's say that the Championship League One and League Two vote to finish the season behind closed doors and do it. Well, if I'm a National League club and if I'm someone like Barrow or if I'm a Halifax or a Stockport, I'm saying, well, hang on a minute. What? We're trying to get into that league and they're still playing. Why have you made the decision to, to end it now? Why didn't yeah. we wait to see what they did? Whereas the Premier League, you know, it might be that the National League were right all along and everyone else is dragging it out too long. We just, we just don't know. So what is the plan with, with the National League? Are Barrow going to go up? Is anything been said yet? Or? So as far as I know, and the daft thing is, we're, you know, it's, we're recording this on a Monday afternoon and by Wednesday or Thursday, it might have changed entirely. My understanding from the National League meeting at the back end of last week was that they voted to end the season and they are waiting to see what the EFL do before they decide if they host their playoffs behind closed doors, if they go points per game, and how that affects the various teams. Now, the one thing that I don't get in all this is criticism of clubs from the governing bodies, from the, the Premier League, that say, well, clubs are just acting in their own self-interest. Of course they are. Why would you not? I, you know, if you're, if you're Norwich or if you're Aston Villa, and Aston Villa have got something like 80% of their Premier League points at home, why would they agree to a neutral venue when most of their points come at home? Of course they're going to act for what yeah. is best for their club because it's not just a club. It's a multi-million pound business and you've got to do what steps you take to what's right for that business. So, I mean, Stevenage might get the luckiest of any team in the country, Stevenage, because they've been terrible all season, 22 points all season, and they might end up not going down. Well, yeah. you know... Well, Mexi, they should just be as bad. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> very true. Absolutely. So, um, again, you've touched on a, a really good point just to move the, the conversation on a little bit as well, which is um, if we take if we take the Premier League and the and the Championship kind of out of the equation, from from my in my opinion, so much of the debate is actually about the fact that there's so much money involved it's, it's it's at that level it's very much about stopping potential lawsuits as much as as much as anything more more so than than preventing you know the, the disease spreading which is what i would kind of say um i think any any time with football it, any kind of gatherings like that are not going to happen you know we're looking at as a hospitality business uh, if, if we're lucky july um the time as we are um more likely September or or onwards. Um, so, in in terms of that, let's take League One and League Two. I um, there was a couple of things just moving around uh, social this week. Um, if if they do end it this week, what would you say? Would you would you say that um, the both of you? What would you think were the best way to kind of um, decide on League One, League Two? Promotion, relegation, playoffs. What, what are we, what are we thinking there, chaps? Go on, Brad. I'll let you go first on that one. Thanks, mate. Um, <laughs> if you're going to do it that way, for me, um, points per game is probably the fairest way to do it. Um, but it then depends. I mean, for me, I certainly with playoffs, you, you kind of because it's not just. You have teams going up through the playoffs and it's not just a straight relegation and promotion. You've got playoffs to, to factor in as well. I, I just don't... 
I really struggle. It's, it's all right criticising the EFL or criticising the National League or anything like that, but there isn't a perfect solution to it. Um, there's no perfect solution. Um, for me, I would go points. If it was me, put on the spot now, and I had to make the decision, I would go scrap the playoffs and it's points per game. And if in League Two you finished, um, you finished fourth on points per game, then you go up. Um, that's how I do it. Put on the spot now for promotion and relegation in League One and League Two. Okay, well, I'm I'm not going to agree with you there, Brody, because it would be a very boring podcast. Uh, <laughs> um, I would have no relegations. I'd have the uh, promotions. I know then, then the season after, I think it would all go back to normal, would have more come down and, and whatnot. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. 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 I just think with the current situation, I think it's only fair that teams go up and not go down. But that's just me. <laughs> That's no, it's um, you know that, that's a good point. I, I I'd like to see if they can do. Um, I'm definitely with you on the teams going up. Um, I think that that would be something. Kind of, um, I actually like the 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 weighted points per game. So the home and away yeah. um, uh, calculations as well. I mean, if you looked at the League Two table based on the weighted um, calculations. Uh, the the top three that are the top three at the moment all go up. Yeah. Um, the 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 only change in in Brody's um, Brody's equation of the fourth team going up is that Cheltenham would swap places with Exeter, but the playoff spots would remain the same, even with weighted points per game. And obviously, then you've got Stevenage remaining bottom anyway, whatever that outcome is. Yeah. And I think that's reflected pretty much in league, the League One table as well. Um, there's very little, and I, I think looking at some of the others that I saw, there's very little change if you go to, you know, from where we actually are. I mean, the, the, the fact is we've completed so much of the season um, that, that, you know, points per game calculations are not going to throw up too many strange anomalies, whether you do that weighted or not. But I, I personally believe that a weighted one you know, allows for the, the team that's got five of the last, you know, or whatever it's six, seven games out of the last nine at home, which sounds a bit strange, but um, it, it rewards them. If people have got a good away record, then they, they're they going to get rewarded better than just a, a flat points per game. And you know what? That just, the last two minutes of this conversation completely sums it up because there's three of us that all have different opinions as to how it should end. So Absolutely. whatever the EFL do, they can't win. No, no. There's always going to be someone who's upset. I'd also throw another little um, curveball in on this one, though. That if um, it's just a, a, a thought um, that if if the fourth place in League Two was going up, and, and likewise the third place in League One, um, what would you think to? a bonus point or three being awarded to the other teams that are in the playoffs that haven't had the opportunity to fight out that ready for the start of next season. So they essentially start next season on whatever it is, plus, plus three. What's your thoughts? Mm, that's a spanner in the works. <laughs> uh, me personally, no, I, I would, I would start everyone afresh. Um, me being me, I've not had any relegations in my league. So the teams have gone up and I've got teams from from the uh, National League up there. So for me, I think everyone's on, on zero points. But uh, Roddy, what do you think? I think that you then, I can understand the suggestion, but I think in then you kind of, um, when this season ends, you kind of need to draw a line under this season. So yeah. next season, everyone starts as you would start the next season. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, not something I've ever, ever considered before, but I think that when a season ends, it, uh, unless you're minus 12 for financial irregularities or whatever, I, I, I well, might be a fair few of them next season. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's kind of where, you know, some of that came from. You know, we've started, clubs have started seasons in the past uh, on minus points. So, yes, mainly for financial irregularities from the previous season. So, um, 
you know, so have call it the COVID points then on your system. Let's call it the COVID three point system. Yeah, absolutely. COVID three points. <laughs> a bonus for the people who, you know, those clubs that have actually performed well this season and just haven't, you know, they've, they've earned a place in the playoffs and have not had the opportunity to actually do something. Um, that was just a, a, a fi final thought. I, I would actually go with relegations as well, by the way, from League would One. Would you? League two. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You are. Too and much. potentially from League Two <laughs> down. <laughs> okay, we need to rebalance things anyway. So it's just a question for me of whether they keep Stevenage in and just move Barrow up or whether, they, you know, personally I would drop Stevenage and bring two up. My, my personal thought. Cool. Um, so uh, what have we got next? So, so we've, there's been a lot of chat talk with a, quite a few um, chairmen, uh, chief execs. Mainly our level, it has to be said. The Premier League um, chaps have been and and late and ladies have all been rather quiet in terms of the top positions. Um, Bar from Brighton's, by the way, he's been very vocal. Is it Paul uh, Barber? Is it Paul Barber at Brighton? He's been you very mean, vocal. Relegation threat in Brighton. <laughs> no comment. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> There's a chance. <laughs> Do you think football can come back from this? What what kind of form of, of of league, if we were to start again, are we going to have? You, you touched on it before, just then, Brody, about the um, the you know what what state pit clubs might be starting on, whether the you're going to have you know 15 clubs, however many clubs starting with minus however many points next season. Um, what's the thoughts? What's the thoughts, chaps? Go on, Billy. You can have this one first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brody. Uh, my thoughts are, um, yeah, it will recover. I think it's very, it's not very good, but the way football is going with the transfer fees and everything like that, I think it's going to be a reality check going into the further seasons because paying, you're starting for an, an average, bang average Premier League player was 50 million. And that was only coming down into leagues where you got stupid prices you're paying stupid wages at the championship league one and league two they were becoming astronomical wages for the, it doesn't support the the ffp um for the crowds you were getting so i think it's a good thing because it's a reality reality check for the teams that are in there ronnie was you mentioned a couple of potential reality checks with uh you know possibly looking at youth a bit more I think, yeah, I think that it's a great opportunity for clubs to cut their expenses. I think it's, I think it's a bad time for players. Um, I think that if you were a player this year in League Two and you were on two grand a week, um, then you may struggle to get a League Two club at a grand a week for next season because there isn't going to be that much money there. I think you'll see an emphasis on clubs that have decent youth academies promoting a lot more into their first team because let's you know let's not be around the bush about it and let's not be let's not romanticize it they're cheaper um yeah. it's a lot cheaper to play three 19 year olds that have come through your system than it is maintaining three players in their mid-20s that have had five years league experience at, at, that, at that level um if clubs play it right then they'll get the fans on board by saying, right, you know, we, we need to rebuild. We've got four homegrown talents in our starting 11 every week. Get behind your local lads. Um, I think players will suffer. Um, where I think lower league clubs might suffer, so if you were, say, and I'll take Peterborough as an example, because Darren McAntony is pretty, um, he's pretty vocal on Twitter. He's done a fair few podcasts, and yeah. I agree with a lot of what Darren McAntony says. But Peterborough, over the last few years, have this fantastic model of bringing players in from non-league and selling them on for a few million quid. Well, if you're now a League One club, if you've got a player that 12 months ago was potentially, if you look at someone like, say, Ivan Tony at Peterborough, who scored 20 odd goals this season, rave reviews, he's flying. Everyone will know that Peterborough, because of this, have less money. So if Ivan Tony was worth, let's say, six million quid, three months ago in January. He's now worth three million quid. Because if you're a Premier League club or a top-level championship club, you're thinking, 
well, they're going to need the money. So three million or nothing. And it's going to force a lot of clubs in League One and Two that have good young prospects that they might lose them for a lot less money than they'd have lost them for even in January. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Listen, guys, we've got um, our guest is just uh, in the waiting room. I might just uh, I might let him in. Let him in. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be joined by uh, our friend of the podcast, a uh, friend of Billy's, um, yeah. and Jillian's, any point. I believe Hopefully it works. Technology. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh the day, got the here, he here he is. There he is. <laughs> Look at that. Eddie of his. <laughs> right Things you make me do. On, see, it's, it's Dan's fault. I played my only before, but it is actually Dan's fault. Is it? Yeah. How cool. So, uh, one of the co-founders, Danny Miller, he did uh, a charity head shave because uh, Dan beat him at FIFA. So again, Dan, Dan's idea was a forfeit was a head shave. So uh, Miller smashed it out of the park and raised over a £1,000, which uh, I don't know Dan will, Dan will tell you guys what it went towards. Um, but I, I sent my head, a picture of my hair to Dan and said, I'm sure I could make some money as well. So Dan was like, all right then, man, man of your word, go and do it. Um, so I let it go for two weeks just to see if he'd forget, and he didn't. <laughs> uh, and now this is the result. So, so Dan, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. <laughs> so, so you're you're the reason there, Dan, for this uh, for us having to see a lot more of Billy's scalp than we would. Like. Yeah, and, and the, uh, I regret it for him. <laughs> <laughs> he has got quite a lot of face, hasn't he? <laughs> it's just got bigger. It's just got bigger. <laughs> lockdown for it either. Um... How's lockdown been for you, Dan? Um, it's wearing out on me now, to be honest. Um, it's, for the first few weeks, to be honest, I really enjoyed it because it gives you the opportunity to get things done that you've just not had the opportunity to do, or you put things like you've got something to do, but you'll do anything rather than doing those little jobs. Um, so give me the opportunity to do that, but that was two weeks in. Once all those are done, you, it's kind of like it's, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. How are you finding? Um you know, general work, I know you've just got a, is your film out? Um, I think as well. Yeah. yeah, so it came out, um, came out in the UK on the 4th of May. Um, but even that, that's been affected. So, the yeah, exactly. Cancelled. Um, it was meant to go in the cinemas, obviously there's no cinemas. And when they've got a release date, that's kind of the release date. So it came out on uh, Amazon Prime um, and DVD, I think, and straight to that, which is a bit of a shame, really, because it would have been nice to have a bit of a... What's that film called, Dan? Enemy Lines. Cool, and you... Um, Dan, Dan missed uh, one of his other mates, his stag do, so Dan had to go for a full week. Um, that's a working, working trip, wasn't it, Dan? No, it was working. <laughs> Where did you have to go, Dan? Um, I went to Belarus for seven weeks. Uh, so it was March yeah. 15... So I had to miss my mess mate stag do because I was uh, I was in Belarus, yeah. Well, you you brought up in Belgium, so the uh, minus thirteen wasn't no no danger for you, was it? No, it was a thirty p a pint. That was an, an absolute nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right, Dan. So thanks for joining us. Um, I know you've been to watch Autumn a few times because um, you like to to remind me. So can you give me an idea of when? When you first went to Latix, you was your dad who took you? Yeah, my dad and my uncle. So I don't know if you're allowed to say this, but I'm actually a United fan and my dad's a city fan. Um, but my uncle was an Oldham fan. So my uncle was going to Boundary Park, like early 90s really. Um, and my dad started going along with him. So I I went along with them. So we started going a lot, you know, going watching, watching them. And it was the days of Andy Ritchie, he's my first memory. Yeah. Um, and then yeah so the problem is it was a bit of um, when United beat Oldham when Hughesy scored alright pipe down <laughs> it was like it was like a torn house because because I've been going to watch Oldham not been going to Old Trafford but I was United fan but I was young so it, it, it was hard do you know what I mean um, but I just remember Andy Ritchie running 
running down the line thinking, wow, he's good. <laughs> That's my earliest memory. You've not taken that into your game, have you, Dan? We can tell that from watching you. No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> It's all right then. So from the early 90s, have you got a favourite memory or? I just, I mean, it was watching Andy Ritchie play because I felt like, when I was a kid, I felt like he scored every time. I felt like he just scored and scored and scored loads. Cool. All right then. So I know you touched on it before with, within the lockdown, you, you, you pretty much accomplished everything you needed to do in two weeks um, of when it started. Um, but before that, you've, you have written a little drama yourself haven't you would you call it a drama short film yeah i started um i started taking up writing because i've worked on quite a few um dramas recently sort of bbc itv dramas so and a lot of i found that a lot of the processes for the police have been flawed slightly or not not too realistic so i started writing and then just at the back end of february we finished our first uh, production which was a short film yeah based on a, a one punch a one punch kill, which was a complete accident. It, it wasn't the punch that, in effect, changes a lot of lives. It was just the scenario, and it, um, and it's just really to highlight how easy that can happen. Hopefully, we can once it's done its festival run, we can send it to sort of schools and colleges and and sort of educate people. Fantastic. So, going into that, I know you just said you the, you didn't you didn't think the police stuff was was done right or correctly. Um, your background was you were the youngest person in GMP, wasn't you, at one time? Yeah, youngest police officer in Great Manchester Police and the skinniest as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Dan likes to get that in, so I'm, I thought I'd get that in for you, Dan. So. Um, probably knows already. I'm yeah, probably know. <laughs> we already know what it's to know. Um, all right, then, so because you, you've joined us, we've asked you to, to let us to tell us your dream for other side. Obviously, you've watched Latics. Um, and I did ask predominantly for Latics players. Um, do you want to take it away? Your formation to start with? At five a side? Yeah. Formation. I've played formations with you, uh, five a side with you, Danny. There's no formations, is there? Oh. Right, well, I mean, I think this is a pretty good five a side team, and I think this is definitely going to... Uh, this is going to beat... I reckon it could beat yours, Billy, definitely. All right, all right. So, give us your goalkeeper and why. Paul Gerrard. And why? He's he's probably the main one that I remember over the years. Yeah. Um, I think I just think he was um, well. He was better than you. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Dan, you've just set a very very low bar for your five side team. If the criteria is better than Billy, <laughs> <laughs> mate. <laughs> It's true, yeah, it's true. That's too good for that. But no, I just remember him. I just remember him. And, when, and for me, when I think of an old and goalkeeper, it's Paul Gerrard that I think of. Cool, no problem. All right, then you defenders. Are you, are you having two defenders? <laughs> I've got one. no. I've got one defender. You only have one defender at um, five side. Denny Sirwin. Okay, obviously strong United connection there. I'm assuming he's in everyone's. Do you know he's not been that not popular, has he, to be fair, Brookie? Um, no, it seems to be... Uh, I think most people have gone for a, 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 someone of a Billy stature as, uh, uh, as a defender, more to take up room on the pitch, I think. Yeah, there's huge strength. <laughs> then I'm going... Then I'm going. what I was going for. <laughs> yeah. Then I'm going goals. I'm just going goals. OK, go on then. I've got... Go to Halley. Yeah, go to Halley, yeah. I've got Andy Ritchie, obviously. Yeah. And I've got Roger Palmer. <sighs> Roger's been in a few, and so has Andy Ritchie, hasn't he? I'm just going all that goals. Obviously, Gunnar's going to be providing the assists, isn't he, from, from wide areas? So I think it's just a, my formation, not including the goalkeeper, is just a four. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, you, you'll have been growing up during that era. Can, can you... Does it remind you of any 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 good times of Dan's team? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, um, Andy Ritchie, Roger Palmer, absolutely players that were childhood heroes. And uh, I think we're coming on to it in a bit about some of the club anniversaries that we've had in the last few weeks. And Gunnar Haller playing a massive part in the uh, the team that stayed up in the Premier League with the three three wins in a week, which I don't like to elaborate on. With Dan being a United fan, that that gifted United their first title in twenty six years. Um, <laughs> 
with the uh, with the win at Villa. Uh, but Gunnar Haller played a massive part in the uh, in the sort of running there as well. So he's picked yeah, he's picked a great team, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd agree with that, Brody. Absolutely, uh, top team that one. Um, it would. I still think these days it would have been it would have been good to see Denny Sirwin in that um, championship. Um, in an Oldham shirt uh, instead of moving on like he did. But to be fair as well, that movement allowed us to get... I mean, you, you forget these days the quality of a, a player like Gunnar Haller, who isn't usually one of the first three or four people that uh, players that people will think, will think about from that era. But he was a Norwegian international, scored hat-trick for internationally. He was, you know, he was getting caps left, right and centre while he was with us. Two World Cups. And and he's you know that that was the level of quality of player we had in those in the teams in those days. It was you, you know you, we were spoiled. We were really spoiled. You are when you compare it to now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no comment on that one. Trying to avoid that. That's that's essentially Billy in goal. Go fake an injury. I go down any time. Don't worry. <laughs> Dan, I thank you for joining us, Dan. It's been a pleasure. Um, I know we'll, we'll be in touch after this, but... Uh... Yeah, I've got a question for you. Um, so, obviously, I remember that Roger Palmer. I remember Andy Rich because he's the, he's the player for me. And when we started arranging these charity matches with Billy and everyone was saying about Roger Palmer and Roger Palmer, so that, that's really how I sort of became aware of him. So I started looking him up. Um, but you guys will know him better than me. Is there a player now that you would says the most similar to Roger Palmer was then. What sort of a, what sort of a goal scorer was he? Oof. That's a broady question. That's yeah. a broad question. That's, that's, that that is a, that's in the parcel. Do you know what? I'm going to, um, I'm going to throw a real... Um, I'm going to throw a, a real uh, curveball in on this one. The one of one of the people that you can kind of equate him to in my mind is actually Thomas Muller uh, for Germany. In that you don't see him very much. You never see him much in a game, and then suddenly he'll be he'll be in the box and scored a goal. And you wonder where he's been for a while. Sounds like Lee Hughes this. <laughs> but it, it, you know, from that wide areas, he was often. I know he, he was conventional centre forward for for probably the first half of his olden career, but after that, it was very much a kind of, you know, he'd be on a wide right, but he was never a he was never a right midfielder or winger. He he was always a a one of a three almost. Part of Joe Royal's front seven. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's um, in dance tactics, isn't it? Doing. Yeah, and I just remember the feelings at the time, you know, as I I started in 86, um, when Roger was probably, you know, coming into his real peak. Um, but even then, I still think about it now, and, and similarly, uh, Dan, I had a conversation about Roger like this not long ago. You try and remember the kind of great goals that Roger scored, and I can probably only remember a couple, whereas with Andy, you're always thinking, oh, I remember this, I remember that one, and this, so that, and you have bits of skill in there. He literally was a ghost. Um, they would, but so exciting. As soon as you, you saw Roger near the ball in the box, you, you, it was a goal. You knew it was going to go in. It was no doubt about it whatsoever. Um, I, I'm stuck for a play these days because I think so much more, plays change so much more that players generally having to do more work outside the box, around the box, put other people into play. That wasn't Roger's game. Roger was get the ball, lay it off, and then suddenly, you know, and the ball later and he'd be on the end of it in the, in the six-yard box. So many of his goals, probably 95% of his goals were in the middle of the box. Um, amazing. Amazing player when you think about it as well. Don't know how, how about you, Brody? I think that, yeah, I think you, you're about right. I think that you kind of, there aren't many players like him today because... Exactly, you say you've, you've got a with the sort of start of the high press, and you, your centre forwards are seen as your strikers, your first defenders, your first line of defence. You've got to chase the ball down. There aren't many strikers that will score a load of goals like that that work that hard. It's 
it's a bit of an anomaly, really. He would be, he'd be very strange in today's game, um, certainly at the top level, because every player adds value to the team when they're playing. Rogers' value was undoubtedly in all the goals he scored. But you're not going to see him chasing back 70 yards for a ball and putting pressure on fullbacks and things like that. So um, there aren't many players like him in the modern game, uh, which I appreciate as a complete cop out and rubbish answer, Dan. <laughs> no, no, right, because football has changed. And like yeah. you know, you're saying, it, you know, you players do have to work harder now, otherwise, not getting the team. So now it makes perfect sense. But so remember that, Billy, for that, our next game, work hard while you're out. <laughs> <laughs> and the manager. <laughs> thanks Dan appreciate your time thanks chat thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. well that was a surprise guys yeah that was Dan Jillings <laughs> good nice uh, five side team as well there as well to add to the uh, the list that we've uh, built up yeah. you know what it was a weird one his five side seems fantastic but I'm amazed at how few Gunnar Haller just seems properly underrated um in that he was fantastic, as you say, Brookie. World Cups, international caps, left, right and centre. And it's strange that Latix fans of our age, so uh, we'll go late 30s, um, uh, I'm just about clinging to it. So, um, but, but Latix fans of, of our age, um, there aren't that many that would pick Gunnar Haller in their sort of five-a-side teams, but he was brilliant. It's, yeah, massively underrated. Absolutely. Agreed. Before my time, but every, every, everyone who I speak to and everything like that and all footage I've watched, it was a lot of players in that team were underrated. And, and there's no surprise that we still celebrate their achievements. Um, today, we, we did the um, Pinch Me Not season, didn't we, a long time ago? And, and Gordon hosted that at the QE Hall and we got the, the team back to, to join in. And everyone just started it's amazing how everyone talks about that time. So hope it con comes around once more during my lifetime. Yeah, which is a good segue actually into the... Oh, Billy, it's almost like you've pre-planned that. That's yeah. unbelievable. It's like we're organised on these things. <laughs> wow. but, um, so, uh, yeah, it's, no, it's a great lead in that. So uh, just this like, the last little chat as well. So, you know, it has been, let's face it, time, time, the time of the year... Um, is always in football. Uh, you get into about April, May. You generally have quite a lot of, uh, of past memories uh, of seasons, but we're quite fortunate. Um, well, say me and Brody are because we were around at the time. Um, that that we've uh, just just been over the thirtieth anniversary of. Um, well, I wrote them down didn't, to circulate them today, and it was just it was just a you know it's just, it's an amazing list to look at, but. We touched on the 30th anniversary uh, in April of the League Cup final, um, which we lost to Forest 1-0. Um, the 1990 FA Cup semi-finals, um, which were played on the TV as well um, last month. Uh, the 3-0 draw with United and then something else happened in the replay. Um, and the 29th anniversary of the league title in 91, Redfern and all that. Um, and even 27 years ago, 1993 was a great escape, which was the three wins of the week that we touched on. Um, and then there was a couple of personal ones, which are a bit closer, um, which was uh, 21 years ago as well, was uh, 1999 when we stayed up uh, by one point after beating Reading on the last game of the season. City beat York the same day, just to stay up. Um, and uh, even 15 years ago was... Uh, when we, when we beat Bradford 2-1 to stay up by a point on the last day, that was a, a Dean Windass landing on uh, Les very early on. and Massive thud in the chat end when that happened. Um, there's a lot of memories there, guys, from, um, from this period of time. Uh, some happy ones as well. Billy, are you going? Well, before my time, that's all I can say for that one. So... Um... Like I said, like I said before, I just want it to come around in my lifetime again that I can take my kids and, and hopefully my grandkids to 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 see Oldham up there in, in the Premiership. It, it's a massive dream being an Oldham fan that I am and you two have experienced it. So I, I kind of like cling on to what you, you're talking about and I, I think one day that could actually be us again. Fingers crossed there, guys. 
Yeah, I think so. How about bro? You, Brody, there's a lot of probably good memories there. and Yeah, it's a bit weird, isn't it? So the last three, sort of, in terms of chronological order, the beating Bradford to stay up, the beating Reading to stay up, and the great escape. It's hilarious that only football fans do it. We were celebrating being the fourth worst team in the league. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, and there were massive parties. Um, oh, fifth the one, one time, I think the 99 one was when there was five, uh, four teams that went down, I think. I think it's, um, and I seem to remember then that York hadn't been in the bottom four all season and were on that last day. And it was Joe Royal City that <laughs> hammered them and we stayed up and all that. Uh, I'll tell you what I found it this week that I never knew. Um, in the Arsenal Crystal Palace game, when we beat Southampton to stay up, Paul Dickoff scored for Arsenal that day. Yeah, yeah he was yeah. one. He was one of the three. I didn't know that until this week, uh, and he posted it on his uh, his Instagram. Um, yeah. It's weird how these things work, isn't it? So Paul Dickoff scored the goal for one of the goals for Arsenal that helped keep us up. John Sheridan gave the penalty away that allowed us to win the league. Joe <laughs> Royal managed the City side that hammered York to help us stay up. It's just weird in football how things like that happen. Um, but I remember the uh, the Bradford game and, uh, yeah, when Dean Windass um, getting stuck in and just almost being the most nervous I'd been. And I was like, 30-year-old, think it's like in my late 20s, going, what? Why am I that? What? <laughs> um, and it's like like going to Northampton a couple of years ago. It's, it's the end of the world. And in theory, it isn't, but it is at the time. And it's like it people that... People are all the way through this, and I know how important everyone's health is, and that is without question the number one priority. But it really bugs me when people say football doesn't matter, because it does. To millions of people in the country, every week, football matters, and it plays a huge part in people's lives. The very fact that we're here now talking about things that happened 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, that all have a significance to our lives at some point, uh, it just bugs me when people say that football's irrelevant because oh, it isn't. Yeah, agreed. I think, I think you're right. Um, there was a nice, uh, a nice phrase you used, uh, which I'll try and try and recollect by um, Steve Parrish, the chairman of uh, Crystal Palace, um, not long ago when he was talking about rel- uh, the current situation. Uh, I think if I call it right, it was something like football is in these times, football isn't irrelevant, but it's a magnificent irrelevance. Um, and it's something that, that we, you know, kind of cling to things like that. And the memories from 30 years ago, and, and you know, people will say, um, you know, you cling to the past and Oldham's all about people clinging to the past and things like that. It's not, you know, for me, it, it's about the history. The history of the club is, is hugely important. And that's what keeps the connection with the fans. And it's what, it's what should guide the principles of the club all the way through each era and as you move forward and it's the the you know it's the we clinging to our well you're clinging to your 30s uh Brody. I've, I've passed that mark I've, I've given up on that one um you know we were the 11 year olds and the 10 year olds and and whatever at the time who who went through that 30 years ago 29 years ago um and i'll be honest it probably I'd, I'd been going since 86 um i'd seen a playoff um, well, whatever it was, almost semi-final, whatever you want to call it, in the in that first season, or just on the you know just on the back of that one, um, to me, um, I'm going to sit down at some point and 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 try and try and ask him how he felt because those memories from like you say 99, 2005, and even the Northampton game, I lived them probably more. Um, than those from 30 years ago when it was more significant, but those from 30 years ago would never leave me. I just, I was amazed that this was Oldham. To me, that was what Oldham were. Oldham were a club that beat teams at home, went 40 odd games at home without being being beaten. You turned up two minutes to go, you're losing. You, you, you didn't have a, there was not a thought of losing. <laughs> you knew there was something coming from somewhere. Um, and and it's things like that, that that we all kind of think. And you know that ninety one day was just you know I've got I've got vivid memories all the way through that day um, at various points. 
I'm sure it's the same for you as well, Brody, with that. Yeah, absolutely. I just remember when when Redder scored the penalty, I was in the Lucas paddock, level with the edge of the penalty area that we scored from at the Chaddy end, and um, was far too scared of what my dad would do 10 rows behind if I ran on the pitch. So <laughs> stayed exactly where I was. And then it seemed that there were about another 45 minutes after that until we could celebrate. And then we went on the pitch and it was all great and everything like that. And yeah, it's memories like that that stay with you forever. Um, so yeah, that's kind of part of your, your history and kind of who you are. Because I mean, I'm the same as you, Brocky. When, when I grew up in primary school and, and secondary school, um, you know, we were, we were consistently beating the top teams. So when we like we got to Wembley twice, we won the league the year after, you would see so many people of my year, your year, uh, I think you were two school years above me, aren't you? Um, yeah. Sort of that sort of period of three or four years, um, all wearing Oldham shirts and all being Oldham fans. And sort of fast forward that 10 years to say, 99 when United, when the treble and Oldham are in League One. And you see the difference then of people in United shirts. You then fast forward another 10 years to when City have suddenly got money and they're good, that it's then City shirts. And it's, it's just a kind of interesting cycle as to kids and generations to who they support and, and sort of why on the back of it. Yeah, I agree with that, 100%. Absolutely. And it's, it's, um, but it's good, to, it's good to reminisce over those times. And um, I know it's the 125th anniversary for the club this year. Um, be nice to see some further kind of memories coming out and um uh you know real recognition of you know not always the obvious people in the history of the club either you know, we talked about potentially you know lights are gonna just being forgotten about but people like uh you know the ian, ian woods of the world and and the ronnie blairs and and uh you know people like that who go back a long a lot lot further than that but and keith hicks and other people like that who from that era's predate us, predate in the same way that we talk about some people, um, Brody and Billy doesn't have a clue who we're talking about. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the same for, same for my dad, same for, you know, uh, older generations of that as well, isn't it? That's it. I mean, my, my dad will always talk about, he, he was there when uh, Bert Lister scored all the goals against Southport. So my dad will talk about that in the same sort of way that I would talk about being there the night Frankie Bunn scored six against Scarborough. So it's, it's that sort of thing. Um, like my dad would rave about uh, when the club signed people like Bobby Johnston. Um, and yeah, that, so it is. It's not just, you know, it, the club has a long and proud history. And it's, it's not just the four or five years that we were good. Um, we've, we've, we've got a longer history than that as well. Um, you know, even, even more recent times, you know, you look at, Beating like even in in sort of Billy's memory, um, knocking Liverpool out the FA Cup, uh, going to Goodison and winning, uh, knocking City out, uh, taking Everton to the replay after the round. After you know, it's we we still got these things that in recent memory, all right. Granted, they're probably getting fewer and fewer, but yeah. we still got these that you know you can you you have the pride in the the being a fan and being there that day and remembering. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know one game that always seems to slip people's memory is the Nottingham Forest one. We, we was in the we was in the crowd that day, Brody, wasn't we, with Jenny, um, and that was just an unbelievable game. And, and I've never felt the atmosphere like that before. And um, who was before that? The game was amazing. So um, yeah, I take great memories from from different places, and I, I can see off <laughs> two places like that. Um, but no, the the game was the game for me was. Very underrated going into it, and the players performed magnificently. Robbie Simpson, Josie Baxter, um, Dean Furman, they were just like so, Yusuf and Changama. These players that it was only not so long ago, people forget very easily. Yusuf was an unbelievable dead ball free kick taker. Um, he's somewhere in Azerbaijan now, I think. and he, I want to be like like you guys say the memories that you have from 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 yonder years and I I cling on to my my probably one of my first memories is the playoffs where we got beat off Blackpool and Keegan Parker rips us up and I've said it on previous podcasts we got Keegan Parker a few years later and, and 
my God, what did we get? What play you got, aren't you? What did we get? So there, there we go. We had uh, we had Sean Gregan to thank for for him that 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 season because Sean kept that team together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some great memories there, chaps. Let's uh, let's hope that uh, there's a few more to come over this uh, whenever this season starts. Hopefully, yeah. so. <laughs> next season, I should say. Um, tell you what, we'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, just uh, thanks to you both for. Um, for, uh, let, give it a go. <laughs> uh, yes, big thank you to Dan as well for joining us. Um, if you've got any um, any uh, people you'd like us to try and get on here, just let us know um, via at Latix Podcast. All about all, uh, all about all about Oldham. I was just going to say <laughs> all things Latix Podcast. Um, get onto the on Twitter. Let us know. Um, what is that Twitter handle, Simon? It's at Slatics Podcast. Right. Um, so um, let us know what you want to, uh, if you've got any ideas. We're looking for some more staff players, uh, some former players, some uh, some general people of, of Billy's uh, acquaintance. My time. <laughs> what my memories that I've got. Um, no. Just just general play, just general people Billy knows will be coming on. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, are we on the phone all week trying to get some people and I've got uh, I've got a few ideas I'm going to get um, but I've, we've got to thank for, throughout the season Brookie we've, we've been really well supported by uh, a big support of Wadmaf IT which is AC Tyres um, when, when AC Tyres has done a, a massive amount for us as a podcast to support us uh, along with the revolution in the Oldham Chronicle um, so from me and I know from, from you guys as well it would be a massive thanks for wearing through support through through the podcast Absolutely. Um, and some, some would also just uh, a shout out to Matt as well from, from Revolution who, uh, who helps us get started this season. It's almost, it is almost like an end of season podcast without having an end of season to uh, talk about. So. Yeah, we'll get to that one day, but um, it's quite funny how Matt, Matt has pulled us all in and, and Brody's John has uh, a, a previous show, but we seem to have got Brody involved now and, and Matt's been integral to, to bring us together. Brody, we've signed you. I've been on front of your agent today. It's all done and dusted. It's a zero, <laughs> fee and a zero payment fee. So thanks for joining. <laughs> Just like us. Cheers, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, and uh, I'll see you guys soon. See you later. Cheers. Stay safe.